Well, welcome to Front Range. My name is Ernest Smith. I'm the lead pastor, and we're so grateful that you guys are here, whether you uh, brave the wind and the cold and all of that to be in person or you're watching online in your pajamas. Uh, we're grateful to have you, uh, no matter how you decided to show up today. Uh, man, I'm really excited about what uh, God has in store for us today. I do want to uh, let you know about something I told you about last week. Uh, we're kind of uh, creating a team right now called the Care Portal Team. Uh, the Care Portal is a local organization that we're partnering with um, that is helping uh, to reach out to families, especially um, families that are a part of the adoption or foster care process. Uh, and so what, we, what we'll do is we'll come alongside these families. Let's say a kid is getting placed in a home, uh, then they're going to have certain needs. They might need a crib or they might need a car seat or a stroller or diapers or clothes or whatever. Uh, and so this team will be the first, kind of the first responders, the ones that will get there. Uh, we'll be able to provide um, uh, the materials that are needed or the funds that are needed or whatever. The cool thing is we get to, uh, to go show up at these, the, this family's house uh, or these families, their houses, and uh, be able to pray for them and care for them in, in different ways. So if you're interested, uh, go see Sienna right outside uh, at um, our connection tent out there. Uh, she can give you more information. You can sign up and get more information out there as well. Uh, today we are going to continue a series that we've entitled, Where is God When? Uh, and we're trying to uh, ask these, uh, these questions because I think all of us at different times in our lives, we wonder, man, where is God? You know, where is God when this happens in my life? Where is God when it snows a foot at the end of May? Good Lord, where are you? You know, uh, I, by the way, how many of you love the snow? You loved it this week? Yeah, that's because you're probably like me. You didn't plant anything. Your trees didn't die, nothing like that. The rest of you are angry uh, right now. Uh, but man, you know, where is God when? And we're asking this in like very broad terms, because I believe that every time we ask, man, where is God in this situation? It can really be put into three categories. Uh, last week, we looked at where is God when bad things happen? Uh, if you missed that, I would encourage you to go uh, listen to that message, go watch that message on our website uh, or on YouTube channel or whatever. Uh, next week, we're going to look at where is God when I'm in need? Uh, today, we're going to ask a question that I think all of us have asked at some point, but most of us, it's been subconscious. And this is the question, where is God when I sin? Or where is God when I mess up? Or where is God when I make a mistake? A mistake. Now, I got I to gotta define what a mistake or, or a, a mess up is. Because when I say where is God when I make a mistake, I'm not talking about a mistake like, like uh, asking a woman if she's pregnant. Uh, which, by the way, you never do that, men. Uh, if you've done that, then you know the horror. Somehow women know when they're pregnant, but men, we get it wrong a lot. Or the mistake of one time, uh, just a few weeks ago, my wife bought me a conditioner for my hair, and I, um, I, I'm a man, so I don't read the bottle uh, or ask questions, and so I thought it was lotion for my face, uh, and my wife um, looked at me like I was really messed up. Or like the one time, a mistake like one time when I wore plaid shorts and a striped shirt. Uh, I didn't know that was a no-no. Uh, so I told my wife, well, I'm colorblind. And she's like, that's not how that works. Um, I'm not talking about those types of mistakes. Uh, I, I'm talking about a mistake that, that should be called a sin. You see, the word sin in our culture, uh, we don't like that word. It seems too harsh. And so we've kind of watered it down by saying a mistake or a mess up or something like that. But today we're asking, where is God when I sin? Now, how do we define sin? In order to understand sin, we have to understand God. Uh, we have to understand that God is our creator, that he has created us, that he is also our father. And being our creator and our father means he has a plan for us. That God didn't just randomly create you, that you weren't some mistake and, then, and you're trying to like just walk through life randomly. No, God created you with a purpose. He has a plan for your life. He knows what's best for you. And so sin, to, to boil it down it's a, in its simplest definition... And I had a bunch of definitions, but my team were like, that's too complicated and that's too long and whatever. So the, the simplest definition I can give you of sin is missing the mark on what God wants for my life. It's missing the mark for what God wants on my life. I like God says, hey, I have certain things that I want you to do. I, I want you to do these things. This is how I've created you, why I've created you. And when we don't do those things, that's sin. Or there are certain things that God says, hey, I don't want you to do these things. That these things are not the way I created you to live. This is not how I created you or designed you to, to act or to be or whatever. And to do those things is sin. 
Now, here's the interesting thing about sin, even though our world doesn't like to use this word sin and, and we try to water it down, I've never met a person who, can't, who, who doesn't believe that they have sin and they can't identify it. Like all of us know that we have sin in our lives and all of us can name it. So if we all have sin, then where is God when we sin? For me, when I first started following Jesus, I, um, I, I understood that I, or I began asking this question, man, where is God in the midst of my sin? I, I remember very specific times where I intentionally sinned, and when I did so, uh, I, I, I wondered, man, why did I do that? I felt shame or guilt, uh, and I remember thinking, man, where is God? Like, is God far off? If he, it's like, it's like he's, he's dealing with somebody else's stuff. He's, he's over here messing with somebody else at this point, so maybe he didn't see me. The problem with that is I believe that God is omnipresent, which means he's everywhere all the time. So I couldn't believe that God was off somewhere else and he didn't see me. So then I had to believe that God was right there with me. And if he's right there with me, then he sees me when I sin. And that's embarrassing. That makes me feel bad. Yeah, the whole WWJD movement was big when I was in high school and in college. You'd wear these little bracelets that said WWJD. What would Jesus do? And part of that movement was to remind you that God is always with you, that he's always there, that he's there in your hotel room, he's there when you're driving, he's there when you're sitting on your couch, that God is always with you. And if God is always with you, then he sees you sin. So what is his response? I mean, if, God, if, if the question is, where is God when we sin, the easy answer is, just like we looked at last week, God is with you. I mean, he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So he's right there. And if God is with you, then what is his response? How does he, how does he respond to our sins? Well, to look at that, we're going to go back to the passage that we looked at last week. Um, this passage uh, is usually referred to as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we talked a little bit last week how maybe it should be defined as the disciples' prayer. The disciples go to Jesus and say, hey, uh, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And this is Jesus' response. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 9, says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, many of us, we've heard this prayer. We've said this prayer, maybe on a sports team or something like that. And, and so we've heard it or we've said it before. But what I, what I want to focus on is verses 12 and 13. It says, and forgive us our debts. Now, it's not talking about like a, a financial debt that you have toward an institution or to God. It's a spiritual debt. It's, God, forgive us of our sins. Some translations say, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors, those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So how does God respond? He responds with forgiveness. He responds by not leading us into temptation, but delivering us from Satan. Now, that doesn't mean that, that we're not going to have consequences. It doesn't mean that, that we're not going to suffer consequences of our sin. God's not saying, well, hey, because I forgive you, the things that you do have no consequences. No, you're going to have consequences. I mean, all sin at some level has a consequence. And so God's not saying I'm going to remove those consequences. He's saying, but I am going to forgive you. And it's not just that Jesus says this here. You see forgiveness from God all throughout Scripture. I mean, you look at Adam and Eve, and, and they're the first ones who sin, and how does God respond to them? There's consequences, but he forgives them. And you look at the Israelites, and the Israelites, time after time after time, they fall into sin. They rebel from God. They miss the mark that God has for them. And how does God respond? There's consequences, but he responds by forgiving them. Then you look at, at scripture, and you can see all kinds of scriptures that talk about God's forgiveness and God's grace toward us. And probably the greatest example of forgiveness and the greatest reminder to us is the cross. I mean, the cross represents God's love for us. The cross is where God said, hey, I'm going to forgive you. Like no matter what you've done, no matter your, the, how great your sin is, no matter how great the consequences may be, I will forgive you. And he died for us to be able to offer us forgiveness. So the issue isn't where is God because we know, we know he's with us. The issue isn't how does God respond because we know based on scripture that God responds by speaking truth. He says this is sin. He responds by grace, by, by dying on the cross for us, and he responds by forgiving us when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. 
And now the question isn't where is God or how does God respond? The question is, how do we respond? It's kind of like last week where we said maybe our perspective has to change a little bit. I think the question is, how do we respond? What is, what is our role when it comes to the sin in our lives? Let me direct you to a passage, it's 1 John chapter 1. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite passages, but it's also probably the clearest about what our role is when it comes to sin. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So God will do what? He'll forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. But we have something. We have a part to play in this. What is it? If we confess our sins. So what's our role? It's confession. Our role is confession. Well, what's confession, Ernest? Confession is simply this. It's agreeing with God what he already says to us or about us. It's just simply agreeing with God what he already says to us or about us. Now, if you're like me, I question a lot of things. I ask a lot of questions about everything in life. And so the first question I would ask here is then if God is there, as we've already established, and he forgives us, then why do we have to confess? Like it seems kind of counterproductive or seems like an extra step. Like if God's already there, he already knows what we did, so then why do we have to confess to him. A couple days ago, uh, I was having a discussion with uh, one of my kids, and uh, they had just uh, done something that was sinful, uh, so we were having a conversation about it. Uh, and the thing that they did wasn't terrible. Uh, it wasn't awful, but it was a sin. And so I was addressing it, and, and this child of mine, or rather of his mother, uh, he, uh, uh, she, he uh, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't admit to it. Like, just wouldn't admit to the sin that they had in their lives. And I was getting so angry. Not because of the initial sin. The initial sin, man, okay, we can walk past this. We can move through this. But you have to confess it. You have to be willing to say, this is what I did. Confession is so important. It's vital to you and I finding health. Why? Because when you confess, you, you embrace the severity of your sin. You embrace the destructive nature of your sin. That's really important. It's not about shame. It's not about having shame and heaping shame on someone. It's about recognizing that our sin is destructive. Not only that, but when we confess, we recognize our need for God. We say, man, I'm human. I mess up. I do things that are wrong. I, do th I miss the mark on God, with God's mark for my life all the time. I need God. It brings healing. Confession brings healing in our lives. I mean, you can't have healing for something in your life unless you're willing to at least get it out into the light. And so you're willing to say, hey, here's what I'm dealing with. Here's what I'm going through. So confession brings healing. Confession also restores the relationship. There's this uh, uh, incredible story of Jesus in John chapter 13, and he's hanging out with the disciples, and, um, and he goes around, and he starts washing each one of their feet. And when he gets to Peter, Peter says, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus gives him this picture of confession. He says, hey, Peter, when you, basically when you've accepted me, that you've taken a bath, but as you walk throughout life, your feet are going to get dirty. And if you want to have communion with me, if you want to have a relationship with me, your feet need to be washed. Jesus wasn't just giving this picture of washing feet. He was giving a picture of confession, a picture of us saying, hey, Jesus, I messed up. I've sinned in my life. And to have that right relationship restored with him. So how do we confess? Well, there's two parts to confession. The first part is recognizing the sin uh, or, or the wrong that you're accused of. That's usually what we think of when we think of confession. We think of like going into a confessional and be like, uh, I've, I've done these things, I've done this. That is, that is admitting what you've done, what you've been accused of. Yes, I have done this thing. But there's a second part to confession. And the second part is a proclamation of your devotion to God. It's two parts. So it's, it's one, there's two steps. There's, there's killing off the sin, and then there's turning to life. And both have to happen. When confession is talked about in Scripture, both of those things have to happen. You can't have one without the other. It would be like having Millie without Vanilli, you know, or, or Chewy, you know, without Han Solo, or the Broncos without a quarterback. Thank you, God, for Russell Wilson. 
Uh, you know, it'd be like that. Like you can't have one without the other. You have to have both. You have to put to death the things that you're doing that are not pleasing to God, the things that are missing the mark, and you have to turn to life. You have to turn to Jesus. I love these passages. I'm going to give you two passages that speak to this. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 22 through 24, it says this. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And then go over to Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. It says, Since then you have been raised where Christ, uh, with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Both these passages says, hey, for confession to work, you have to have both. You have to have a devotion to God, a, a, a swearing of God, I am with you, I love you, I want you in my life. And you have to be a, a, have a putting away, a putting to death of the, the immoral things. There's two steps. The first one is put to death. Put to death what? Well, Colossians just told us, put to death things like sexual immorality and evil desires and, and lust and greed but it's also selfish desires, earthly desires, the things, whatever takes your heart away from God, whatever causes you to miss the mark that God has created for us to live out. Earthly, selfish, consuming things in our lives, they're so damaging, not because if you do them one time that they're gonna ruin your life, but because the more you do them in your life, the more they become idols. I wanna say the word idols, I don't mean like this little carved image thing that, that we sometimes think of when we hear the term idol, like a little carved creature of some sort. I'm not talking about that. An idol is something that consumes you, something that grabs a hold of your heart. Some would say something that you worship, but, but I would say maybe don't use that term because, because when we say that, you're going to think, well, I don't worship these things. I don't worship money. I don't worship power and all of that stuff. But it's something that grabs a hold of you, that you spend uh, an inordinate amount of time and energy focusing on, on these things. That would be an idol. Tim Keller, he, he's a pastor and a theologian. He says it this way, these earthly things that we're to get rid of, we rest in them, build our lives on them, and look to them rather than to God for our identity, meaning, salvation, and love. That makes them idols, things that we have to have in order to receive life joyfully. Idols always master us, creating inordinate, hard-to-control desires of fear, anger, drivenness, and addiction. So the first part of confession is, putting to death the idols, putting to death the sin in our lives, the things that so easily creep into our lives that grab a hold of our hearts and that begin to control us, the things that give us meaning, that give us power, the things that, that we want to hold on to so strong. First part of confession is killing those things, putting them to death. How do you do that? Let me give you three steps. There's probably a lot of ways to put to death sin in your life. Let me give you three steps. Number one, make it timely. So you got to confess it timely. Like you got to do it quick. A friend of mine told me a long time ago that the mark of spiritual maturity is how quickly you confess your sins. And I think it's very true. Because I think if you're willing to confess, you're willing to say, okay, I acknowledge this. I acknowledge what I've done wrong. I acknowledge that I've rebelled against God, that I've missed the mark with God. And so God, I need you. I want healing in my life and I want to restore this relationship. But the longer we let that sit, the less mature we are, the less willing we are to restore that relationship. I, it's very similar to like a marriage. Like those of us who've, who are married or we've been married, we understand that, that the mark of a maturity, the maturity in a relationship is the willingness of someone to say, hey, I, I messed up. Hey, I sinned. Hey, I did, I did my part, but I'm sorry. So you've got to do it. You've got to make it timely. Number two, you've got to own it completely. You gotta own your sin completely. 
Can't say, man, somebody else made me do it or, you know, uh, it's the conditions, I'm just so stressed. I think so many times we treat sin like I treat stress eating. You know, I'm like, I just, I want this chocolate and I want this candy and I want these brownies and I want all these things. And like, man, Ernest, why are you eating so much? And it's like, I'm stressed. There's just a lot going on. I'm thinking about a lot of what if it's like an easy outlet. We treat sin like that. We think, well, if all these, if I had slept more, if I wasn't dealing with this in my life, or this issue hadn't happened, or, or this tragedy hadn't happened when I was younger or whatever, then I wouldn't be doing these things. God's like, hey, just own it. Just own it. If you have kids, you want your kids to own their sin. Like, hey, just admit what you're doing. Just say, hey, I did it. That's on me. Like in our house, the thing that we won't tolerate is lying. That's the thing we won't tolerate. We'll tolerate. We could deal with a lot of stuff. But lying is you not owning it. I've done a lot of marriage counseling over the years. I mean, I've seen God like, create crazy restoration. I mean, from some of the worst places I've ever seen. But the thing that, that I've noticed, the marriage that won't make it, is a marriage where one of them or both of them can't admit their sin. Can't say, yep, I've participated in this. I've been a part of this. I've helped cause this. That marriage is doomed for failure because you can't own it. So with your sin, when it comes to confession, you got to make it timely. you got to own it completely. And lastly, you got to respond personally. Respond personally. What does that mean? It means not just saying, oh, yeah, my bad. That's on me. Now, when you sin, it's you going before God. Hey, God, I've sinned. I've sinned against you. I've missed the mark here, and I'm sorry. I've been reading a lot in Psalms lately, and, and David wrote, uh, King David wrote a lot of the Psalms, and time after time after time, he goes, hey, God, I've sinned against you. I have done this. He's not going, my bad. Um, sorry about that. He's going, no, here's my junk. I'm going to make it timely. I'm going to own it completely, and I'm going to respond personally to my sin. But that type of confession is just one step. That's the putting to death. The other part is the proclamation, the proclaiming your love and your devotion to God. And you have to have both. You can't have true confession and true healing and true restoration without both. Why? Because of the heart. You see, the heart has this desire for an ultimate source of love. You were created that way. Every person in here, every person watching online, we were created for this, this ultimate source of love. And because you were created for that, it cannot be displaced. It can only be replaced. Well, what does that mean? It means you cannot remove the heart's affections. Listen to this. If you don't catch anything else, listen to this. You cannot remove the heart's affections for power, approval, comfort, and control from one object so you can't remove the heart's affection for this object and the need and the desire for this object without showing the heart a greater, more desirable, beautiful object. And that's Jesus. It's a lot like, um, let me make it simple for myself. It's a lot like sweet tea. Now, I know some of you, you don't like sweet tea and it's okay. Not all of us can be perfect. But for some of us, we do like sweet tea. And I'm not talking about the sweet tea that you get and you have to put the sugar packets in there after it's cold. That's not sweet tea. That's tea with sugar at the bottom. That's all that is. I'm not talking about that. I'm also not talking about this nasty stuff. Okay? Anything that comes in this type of form, don't buy it. Okay? That's of Satan. Now, I had this earlier today. I had this earlier and my daughter said, oh, dad, can I have some of that? I'm like, you like that? She goes, yeah. I said, I'm sorry for how I've raised you. And she was confused on that one. Um, this is gross. The good sweet tea is you got you to gotta put it in the water. You got to boil it. Then you got to dump the two, three cups of sugar in there. <laughs> Let it get in there. This sweet tea is from, it's some of the best sweet tea I've ever had in my life. That's why we've already had some of it this morning. It's from actually Pastor Mike's wife, Hillary. And she's true Southern girl, like through and through. You talk to her like, yep, you're from the South. You, you hear it in her voice, but she makes the best sweet tea. And you can have this like imitation pure leaf stuff or gold leaf or 
Gold Peak or whatever all that junk is out there, or you can have the real stuff. You pour it in. This is my cup, by the way. That's, that's easily how much sweet tea I drink in one setting. This is the sweet tea you might want. That's some good stuff. This is the better stuff. You see, in life, we're willing to settle for this. This imitation stuff that at the end of the day doesn't taste that good. My daughter said, Dad, there's going to be people who disagree with you on this. And I said, there are people who are wrong, babe. It's okay. (laughs) This is the imitation. For people who like real sweet tea, this isn't it. Will you settle for it? Maybe. If you have nothing else, maybe you'll settle for it. But if this is all you know, then you never turn to the real stuff. Your heart never gets directed to the right thing. And when it comes to sin, the sin feels good for a moment. It feels like maybe you have control. It feels like maybe you have some power. It feels like, you know, maybe, maybe this is what this, but this feels good. God's going, but you haven't tasted what really is good. You haven't tasted what is great. You haven't turned your eyes to Jesus. The only way to replace sin, to truly replace this great love that we have, this desire for this ultimate source of love, the only way, you can't get rid of it, the only way to replace it is to turn your attention from the sin to the Savior. You realize how great and how beautiful, how incredible our God is. Now, you don't do that by just coming to church once a week. That's great. Come to church, be a part, worship, hear the word of God preached, all of that, that's great. But to really see Jesus in his fullness, it takes a pursuit. Like us actually pursuing after him. What does that mean? It means reading his word. Like getting a Bible that you can understand that if you need one, man, we have some out in our connection center. Download the Bible app. It means trying to get into this more often than you are right now. I'm not putting legalism behind this. I'm not saying if you're not reading this for five hours a day, seven days a week, you know, blah, 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 that you're not a good believer and you can't see the beauty of Jesus. I'm saying just do it more than what you're doing right now. I mean, spending time in prayer. Not just like when you have a need, not just like, oh God, I need you now, but like, God, thank you. God, you're incredible. Even if it's just praying the, the Lord's prayer every day, God, how great you are, how powerful you are, how majestic is your name, God. It's spending time in worship. For some of us, that's easy. We do that on a regular basis. For others of us, we're like, oh, that's a little weird. Then just put it on. You don't have to sing to it. Just try something different than what you're doing maybe now or try doing it more than what you're doing now. It means pursuing Jesus so you can see the beauty of Jesus. If you need some next steps with that, we have a resource page. You can text the word resources to the number on the screen and you can get all kinds of resources. Just take a picture of that that screen right now and so you can get that later and just text resources. We have all kinds of resources, books and blogs and podcasts and all kinds of stuff that will help you on your journey to replace this inordinate love and desire for these things that put death in our lives over to this beautiful source of life called Jesus. Confession. If we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a beautiful passage. Because I don't know about you, but my sin is great. I'm not perfect by any stretch. And I need the grace of God and the forgiveness of God every day of my life. Every day. But I have a part to play. My part is confession. So when it comes to putting to death the sins in my life, I'm going to make it timely. I'm going to own it completely. And I'm going to respond personally. And then I'm gonna put, once I put to death those things, I'm going to turn my devotion and my attention to that which is greater, to Jesus. 
so that my love for these things will be replaced by my love for this thing, for him. May that be true for all of us. May we find not only salvation, but every day redemption and healing and restoration, our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and I thank you so much, God, for your word. And God, what a challenging topic. Talk about sin and confession. It's not a fun one, God, but it's one that is so crucial to our relationship with you. God, one that we have to have. God, in order for us to be restored and be healed. And so, Father, I just pray right now for those of us in this room, God, and those who are watching online, I just pray, God, that you would bring to light where we are in this confession process. And these two steps, God, that we have to take. For some of us, God, we're struggling with putting to death the sins in our lives with confessing those things in a timely way, with owning it and saying, yep, I did this, and making it personal, coming before you, God. The beauty is that you already know, and you've already died for our sins. God, when we confess, we find some healing. We find forgiveness. We find restoration. So, Father, I know that there are people who walk into this place every week or are watching online every week, Father, that if we're being real with where we are, so some of us right now, God, that our sin has been controlling our lives, that our love for our sin has trumped our love for you, that our love for these things in our lives has surpassed anything else, God, that you've done in us or for us. So God, for those of us who've walked into this place and we can recognize that, God, I pray that right now we would confess those sins to you in this moment. That we'd confess our need for you right now in this moment. Father, that we would come home. What does that mean? It means recognizing what you did on the cross, Jesus, for us. That you paid the ultimate price so that we can be forgiven. And as we confess to you our need for you, God, may you bring salvation into our life. In fact, right now, with every head bowed and eyes closed, if you'd say, man, Ernest, that's me. I came into this place feeling far from God, feeling separated from him, honestly allowing my sins to control me, or, man, I've never given my life to Christ, or I did, but I have not been living for him. I've been living for me. But today, you want to make that proclamation that, okay, I'm going to put my faith, I'm going to renew my faith in Jesus today. That's you with every head bowed and eyes closed. I just want you to raise your hand. I want to know who to pray for in this moment. Amen. 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 Father, thank you for each one of these individuals. If you're watching at home, just text the word follow to the number on the screen. And God, I thank you that you know each person by name. You know their story and their journey. And I thank you that you died for all of us. And God, for all of us, I pray that not only will we choose to put to death the sins in our lives, but God, we would proclaim our devotion to you, that we would turn our attention and our heart, this desire for this ultimate source of love, that we would turn it to you, Lord Jesus, and find that you are more beautiful, that you are greater, you are more filling than anything else in our lives. Help us to take those steps today. In Jesus' name, amen.